Hello everyone, welcome to the weekly Torah portion class on this week's parsha, Kitavo. Kitavo literally translates to uh, when you come. And it, in this context, it's, I'm going to read directly from the, uh, from, the, from the Bible here so that you guys can have a little bit of context on what we're talking about. And when you come to the land, that uh, God is giving to you as an inheritance, and you'll inherit it and you will dwell there. So, in this week's portion, there are two, two ideas that we need to talk about. The first one is to understand our spiritual development, and the second one is to talk about the contrast between uh, blessings and curses. And why specifically those two topics are tied to uh, this week's portion is because in this week's portion, uh, there, is a, there is a moment where half of the Israelites go on one mountain, half of the Israelites go on the other mountain, and uh, the first group of Israelites on mountain A, uh, they say like, they're the ones who say like, if you follow all these laws that God gave you, then you'll have all of these blessings, and then the other side says, if you don't follow these laws, then God has all these curses in store for you. So, a lot of duality in this portion. Now, when we're taught, when it, so when it says the land in the Torah, in the Torah, the Torah is almost never a literal storybook. It's there's always a deeper meaning, always a code. So, the spiritual meaning of when you come, when you come to the land, it doesn't mean when you go to this physical place it's called Israel or Canaan back then. You you look at it as a you know a spiritual mindset almost, and it's that and it's that moment of. The moment of taking the land, take, um, inheriting the land, means when the when the soul is able to overcome the body. Our body has this tendency has tendencies. We need to eat. We need to sleep. We have uh, desires for different things. When we are able to say no to ourselves, when our soul is able to transcend our body, that is when we have inherited the land, so to speak. But what is what? Why why is there this duality between the soul and the body? Why were we uh, created like this. So with uh, Rosh Hashanah, the uh, Jewish New Year coming up, uh, Rosh Hashanah takes care of two things. The first one is people is it's when people how long people are going to live is decided, how healthy they're going to be, how much money they're going to make. These are all physical things. And then there's also the spiritual side, how happy they're going to be, how fulfilled they're going to be. A lot of people they can make money, they can be the healthiest person alive, but they don't really feel happy with themselves. Lots of people make a lot of money, get really successful, and overdose on antidepressants. It happens, unfortunately. So how do we get to this idea of spirit, of being able to get our soul um, to transcend what our body desires? So the way, the way we do that, according to the Kabbalists, is to be able to receive what the Creator wants to give us the way the Creator originally intended it. And that is, the Creator wants to give us endless fulfillment without side effects. So, in order to be able to understand that concept, imagine, for those of you who have kids or have had kids, um, imagine your kid is constantly asking for candies or toys or whatever, now, if you constantly say yes, they'll get spoiled. That's just how it works. But you obviously want to give them probably more than they're probably more than they know they want it. So it's kind of the same. It's kind of the same idea. The creator wants to give us everything, but if we're not ready for it, it could have bad side effects. And when we reach this level of being able to say. I don't want it because I want it because our desire because we we as people are very small compared to the creator we we can we can't possibly uh, aspire to think like the creator does so the true the true desire is to want something for the sake of the creator wanting to give it to us the only reason like I, ideally spirit, uh, when we achieve spiritual perf uh, perfection and I am not there <laughs> is when we want something simply because we know that the Creator wants us to have it. And that's when we've reached that higher spiritual level of inheriting this land. And 
to illustrate that point, I would like to read another verse to you. And the context is, this is uh, what the Israelites will say. There is a commandment to give a certain percentage of everything that they grow, everything that they make, over to uh, the temple of God. So, this will be what the Israelites will say as they're giving over this percentage. Here I've, here I've come and I've, and I've brought every the first, like, the first fruits of, of what I've grown. So the first fruits of what I've grown in the land that you gave me, God. And you will put it down in front of Hashem, your God. And you will bow before, before your God. And basically what this, what this verse truly means is, how, how do you know that you've achieved the point that where you only want to uh, receive because the Creator wants to give you? It's when you start wanting to give everything that you have. You want to start giving back. So the way you know that you're on the right path is you start wanting to, let's say you are a generally happy person. If you are, if you are not the type, if you aren't trying to make other people happy or sharing your technique and how to be happy, then you haven't really started to become truly happy. And it won't really last. Which brings us to the point of blessings versus curses. And before I uh, delve into that, uh, does anybody want to give their opinion on what they think a blessing and a curse is? All answers are okay. I feel like a blessing is uh, almost like an opening of your consciousness. And I feel like the curse is like the closing down. I feel like sometimes it can almost be like self-imposed. You just shut yourself down. Mm -hmm. I feel like that can manifest into like a real life curse on yourself. Okay, I like that. It's nice. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, the Kabbalists teach that um, the definition of a blessing is when the physical things, what, when the definition of something physical is that it has an end and a beginning and it breaks down eventually. That's what physical things are. A blessing on a spiritual level is when the physical starts to last forever. So even our emotions, to a certain extent, are physical. When we are able to keep that sense of fulfillment, that sense of happiness forever, that's when we know we've been blessed. And a curse is obviously the opposite. So with that said, I'd like to read something from the Zohar, a book written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And it will kind of help, you know, uh, expand the point of blessings versus curses and why, but what's so special about the fact that there are so many blessings and curses in this week's portion. So, in the times of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it was during the times of the Roman Empire, there was a decree out to put uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to death because he had spoken against the Roman Empire. So he was on the run and he ran to the uh, desert in a place, to the desert called Lud. And he, uh, he hid in a cave. He went with his son Rabbi El Azar. They had a miracle happen to them when they went to this cave. A carob tree instantly grew, and, there, and a stream just happened to appear and go right by the entrance of the cave, so that they wouldn't have to go anywhere to look for food and water. And this is how they used to eat and drink. And um, what they did every day was, um, Elijah the prophet would come twice a day to them, and would just study with them and teach them uh, the secrets of the Zohar and the Torah. And nobody knew where they were. Now, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when he ran away, left students and colleagues behind, and he was like the leader of the he was the leader of the generation. So now his colleagues and his students are left behind to their studies, but they don't have their leader. So now. They're, they have a question in, the, in their place of study. They said, 
Now there are two places where there is a list of curses. One is in the uh, third book of Moses, and one and one is in the fifth. So they said the curses in the third book, the, the first set of curses, is um, keneged means basically uh, opposite or it corresponds to the first holy temple. So there were, there were two holy temples, they were both destroyed. So the first set of curses corresponds to the first temple. Kalot shebe Mishnah Torah hem keneged bayit sheni. Vagalutah achona. So, and then the second set of curses corresponds to the second temple, its destruction, and the ensuing exile, which we are still in today. Now, what's the difference between these sets of curses? In the first set of curses, um, at the end, there are promises from God that don't worry, everything will be okay. Um, it, it expresses the love that God has for the Israelites and promises them that even even the, even if these curses happen, everything will be okay. And it brings a verse where it actually says that God God says that He will remember His promise to Jacob, one of the forefathers, which was a promise that He will make uh, the Israelites and a great nation, numerous like the stars. And he says that even even when they are in exile, even when they are in the lands of their enemies, God will keep his promise. But with the second set of curses, the one in this week's portion, there are no there are no promises like that. Then and there is absolutely no um, apparent uh, comforting after the set of curses. The first set of curses gave the set of curses says, but don't worry, everything will still be okay. This set of curses, not the case. So um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's colleagues saw this and they said, well, uh, everything that God says must come true. So how do how do we how do we uh, reconcile this this fact that there's a gigantic list of curses, 98 curses to be exact, and there's no comfort after. There's no promise that things are going to be okay. How do we reconcile that? Kam Rabbi Yehuda Bar Elai ve'amal Rabbi Yehuda Bar Elai, which was one of uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's colleagues, Oy al Chesrono Shel Bar Yochai. Woe is to us that we are missing Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. They missed their teacher because they knew that their teacher would be able to answer this question and he had to run away and nobody knew where he was. So they didn't even know how to contact him. And he said, and he says, and he goes even further, he says, even if, even if there was somebody else who knew the answer to this question, every answer, uh, every answer to questions like these must have, you must have like divine permission to be given. So even if somebody else knows it, they don't have the permission to give this answer. So what are we going to do now? Rabbi Yossi Bar Yehuda, Kam Yom Echad So another member of the another member of this uh, group of people, Rabbi Yossi, woke up one morning. Ra'a Kol Elu Ha'ofot Shayu Ma'ofafot saw some pigeons or doves outside. Be'ona Achat Halacha Atrayim. So it was actually just a group of regular birds, and then there was a dove in this group of other birds. Kind of a weird scene. Kamar Aglav Ve'amal Yona Yona Hane Menet He starts talking to the dove. A lot of times in the Zaha, um, these people were on such a high level they could speak to in and out, inanimate objects, they could speak to plants and animals. Mimei Amabul Hatsura Shel Ha'am Hatsura Shel Ha'am Kadosh Ki Yisrael Nikrem Yona Now, he um, he talks about in in the times of the of the flood with Noah's Ark, the way that Noah found out when the flood had ended and when there were, when dry land appeared again is he sent a dove. And when the dove came back with an olive branch, that was the sign that the flood was over and it was, and we could get out of the boat then. So he starts he he praises the, the dove for for what it did in the times of Noah's Ark. 
שליחות אחת לבן יוחאי במקום שהוא שם. So he asks the dove, please go send a message to רבי שמעון בר יוחאי, wherever he happens to be. היונה סבבה וקמה לפניו. The dove actually responded, it turned around and started looking at him. It's really cool. כתב מכתב אחד ואמר מה שאמר. So רבי יוסי took a little piece of paper, wrote down the question that they had. ויונה קמה ולקחה מכתב בפיה, he folded up and Normal, normally most messenger pigeons, you have to tie it to its foot. This dove was special. This dove came up to Rabbi Yossi and took it of its own accord from his hand in its beak. So it actually took the paper, flew to Rabbi Shimon, and gave him the thing. He looked at this. So Rabbi Shimon read the paper. And he cried. Why did he cry? הוא ורבי אלעזר בן נום, ואמר, בוכה אני על שנשרפתי, מן, שנר, שנפרשתי מן החברים, ואני בוכה על דברים אלו שאינם נגלים להם. So, him and his son both start crying, because, and they say, we cry because we are separated from our friends, from our colleagues, from our students, and that we can't give them the answers that they seek. מה יעשו הדורות האחרונים אם יסתכלו בזה? What will, what will future generations do when they, when they ask this question, if we, don't, if we aren't able to give them the answer? As they're having this uh, despairing moment, Elijah the Prophet shows up. Elijah said, You know, I just got here. I was actually sent for a different reason, reason but I see that you're crying. But I got, just got the you know, text message from God that I have to make you stop crying now. Oh, Rabbi, oh, Rabbi. Um, this, it's, it's an expression in Hebrew of great respect, so the Elijah the Prophet is showing Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai great respect. Originally, you weren't supposed to reveal this except for to the, the highest of people, this answer that the, that these, that the colleagues seek. But this is what God told me. In the first set, of uh, curses, there are 32 verses. Vikulam keneged shvile Torah. And every verse, there are, there are 32 paths to the Torah, which is a very deep secret for another time. But there are 32 paths to the Torah, and there are 32 verses in, this, in the first set of curses. Each one corresponds to the other. In the second set of curses, there are 53 verses. Those correspond to the 53 portions in the Torah. Okay, so. In the first set of the first set So, in the first exile, after the destruction of the first temple, The first temple was destroyed because the Israelites had transgressed almost um, in the 32 more secretive paths of the Torah. So they had made like blatant, blatant uh, transgressions, but it was, they were still not doing what they were supposed to do. So he says, Shen Abonam Gadol. So he says, that, so these transgressions are obviously bad enough to have destroyed the first temple, but they aren't as bad. That's why after the, after the first temple was destroyed, it was actually said, God actually gave them a time period. They said, he said, after this much time, you're, gonna, you're going to be redeemed. And that's exactly what happened. Seventy years after the first exile started, the Israelites came back to the land. And that was because their transgressions weren't as bad as if they had blatantly transgressed. בגלות האחרונה של בית שני עברו ישראל גן פרשיות שהם הדרכים הגלויים. When it came to the second to the destruction of the second temple, the Israelites were already transgressing the most 
simple basic and in simple basic laws in the most blatant ways. And because of this, and that's why they they weren't specifically they were not given a time period after the, for this exile. I mean, it's been two thousand years and counting. We were not given a time period, um, and there was no comforting statements after the curses because this this is a different level of transgression. It's a it's a worse level of transgression. As Elijah and Rabbi Shimon Bar are talking, a big wind starts to pick up and separates them. And Elijah starts um, raising up, or you know, going that way, <laughs> in a circle of fire. It's really like this is like movie level stuff, honestly. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, I mean, for me, this would be a really good answer to the question. For Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it wasn't enough. So he starts crying, and, he, and instead of going inside the cave, he decided to, to spend the night right, right at the opening outside. Because he, he, he didn't feel like that, was, that answer was enough for him. Around uh, seven seconds later, Elijah the prophet shows up again. And he starts praising him as, um, praised is your lot, that God actually saw you, saw that you wanted, that you wanted more and respected you enough to send me back to give you more, to give you another answer. He said, you know what, actually, all the comforting statements that we see in the first set of curses are actually hidden within the curses in the second set of curses. What, what does that mean? <laughs> so he gives, a, he gives a kind of a story, uh, a fable almost, to kind of explain what he means. So there's a king that loves his son very much. So have you ever heard the expression when parents are about to hit their kids that this will hurt me more than it hurts you? Same kind of concept here. <laughs> So he says, I'm only doing this because I love you. When he, when the only reason that this king, this king gets angry at his son is because he loves him, because he wants him to learn about how the world works. Same way with God. Even though God gives us all these curses, and if you want, um, later you can go read the English translation to the curses. There's some really bad stuff in there. It's pretty bleak. But he says, even though that God uses this really harsh language, he's only doing it because he loves us. He still loves us. So he says, the, the real difference between the second set of curses and the first set of curses is that the second set of curses sound really bad, but they were with, they were with the intentions of love. But the first set of curses are actually really bad. <laughs> like, those, those have, have, those have that's, because he says the, the comforting after, then that means that the actual curses themselves were said with the full intent of those curses. And it reiterates, so in this second set of curses, there is a duality of judgment and love, judgment and mercy. Just like um, a father educating their son. Tough love. So it's, it's reiterating this idea of tough love, of a father only punishing or reprimanding his son because he wants him to be better, because he knows that he can be better. And when, if we look at the worst one of all these curses, it has to be, 
הוא זה שכתוב, גם כל, חולי, גם כל חולי וכל מכה אשר לא כתוב בספר התורה, בספר התורה. So there's one, one of the curses in this second set of curses in this week's portion is, and also everything that's not written here, יעלם השם עליך עד השמידך, will also happen to you. So everything that's not, but you know, the actual translation of the word יעלם, which is, which is what is normally, which is what is today translated as, will also, the actual translation of that word will, is disappear. Kind of weird to use that word in this context, right? This is where we know that these curses are actually with love. How? Well, how does this make sense? It doesn't say Yale. Yale would have been the proper word to use. That would have said these curses will rise up upon you. Those, that would have been a proper word to use. Yale means disappear. What is, what is this word doing here? And all, these curses, and all the curses that aren't written here will disappear. It doesn't make sense. שפירושו שיחבוש אותם ויכסה אותם בנקב uh, במקומם שלא יצאו לחוץ. How do we interpret this word disappear? He says, he's not going to rise up these, he's not going to raise up these curses on you. He's going to take all these curses and cover them and hide them away. Make them disappear. ויהיו מכבושים ומכוסים בתוך הנקב שלהם. And they'll go back to where they came from and we don't have to worry about them. So that's, that's why the word disappear is there. So normally when God makes these types of promises until, until the complete, so one of the, the ending of that verse is until, until he destroys you. Normally, a lot of, normally the language used is um, which means forever. But it doesn't use that language here. Why? Because God made a promise. God made a promise that at the end of days, uh, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites, will be okay. So he already made a promise, and we know that God does not go back on his promises. So even with all these curses, we know that he can't actually um, completely destroy us because he made a promise. So that's how we know that this word that doesn't seem to fit, that's how we know what it means. We know that it means that he will make all these cur all the curses we just mentioned disappear. Really cool. And um, honestly, that concept for me at least, a lot of times, uh, you know, like uh, in school, I kind of, I was in, in middle school more than high school, but I was kind of like a little bit of a, a little bit of a troublemaker. I ended up in the principal's office a lot. And when I was a kid, I would, I would, I would always be like scared of the principal because he was this big scary guy and he talked really loud. And then like as I grew older, I, I understood. I was like, when you're a kid, you don't really understand why what you're doing is wrong. You just know that you want to do it and then you do it and that's it. We, because when you're a kid, you don't really understand the cause and effect of things. So I understood that when, when, peop when people who care about you, really care about you, get loud or make all these threats or give you a punishment, it's not, it's not bad at all. It's like getting a shot. It, it hurts. And when you're a kid, like I, I, was, I was terrified of shots until I was like 12 years old. It took me forever to get it. I'm st I still don't like needles. But you know, but the reason that we go get shots is that we know it's good for us. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's scary, but it's good for us. And that's really one of the main concepts. So, um, just a story to uh, kind of bring together this idea of um, re of blessings and curses, and also um, our spiritual development. So when we have our spiritual development, we have this, we have this uh, journey, and it's actually uh, mirrored in the Torah. The, the last week's parsha was called Kitetze, when you go out, and this week's portion is Kitavo, when you come back, when you come in. So last week's portion started with the, the Kitetze the Milchama Aloyvecha, when you go out to um, make war with your enemy. And uh, based on last week's class, it was taught that. 
It doesn't mean external enemies, it means your internal enemy. Your desire to do things wrong, your desire to eat too much, your desire to sleep too much, or whatever, whatever you may struggle with in your life. And we all have something. And it says, once you've finished fighting that, kita voiladas, that's when you'll inherit the land. That's when, we'll, that's, when you, that's when you'll be able to achieve that spiritual ascension. And there's a story um, about a man named Choni Ameagel. Choni uh, was his name. Ameagel means the circle maker. And the story goes like this. Um, it was a town, I believe, somewhere in Eastern Europe. I may be wrong. Um, they, had, they had a problem. There, was, there hadn't been any rain in a while. They were going through a little bit of a drought. So Choni wasn't the biggest rabbi in town, but he was a rabbi and you know, he knew kind of what he was doing. And they were having like this big prayer service to try and help bring the rain. Nothing was working. Weeks went by, no rain. So Choni Amagel, what did he do? He went outside, took a stick, drew a circle on the ground. Stepped into the circle. He goes, God, I'm not leaving here until you give us rain. Now, um, if it was me, I would not talk to God like that. Especially if I, if, especially if I was confident that I get an answer. And a lot of the, a lot of the leaders of that community were very angry with him. They said, "How, how could you be so, so brazen with God?" He says, "No, it's going to work. You'll see, because." When we reach that level of spiritual ascension, we just want to share. And when we know, when we, when we're truly in, in, when we're truly at that level, we understand that it's okay to have a little bit of ego if it's for the right reasons. Ego is not a problem within itself. Ego gives you the confidence and to do the right thing. So when we have, when we're once we're already in the right place, then we can have the ego. And the story continues that. So he asked for the rain, and immediately it started to drizzle. He said, God, that's not what I meant. You know what I meant. I want more. So now it starts to pouring rain, like almost hurricane level. He said, God, that's too much. This guy, this guy is just having, like, as if God is standing right here. And then it starts to rain normally. And then he said, um, and then the story ends that it, was, it rained, and, but it wouldn't stop. So he's, and, and so the people asked for asked for Choni to make it stop because it was going to start flooding the streets. Um, in, Kabbalah, in Kabbalah, rain is a, sign of, is a sign of purity, of cleansing, and he told them, you don't understand the blessing you missed by asking for me to stop, for asking for me to stop the rain, but I'll stop it if you want me to. Because, he, because you have to understand that he was on that level. But not everybody is on that level. So in, until we are ready to receive it won't have good side effects. And that's why, that's why it had to stop. And uh, one last concept about our list of curses. This is from someone named Rabbi Shimshon of Astropoli. I do not know when he lived, I just know that he lived in Europe. So it starts, so he quotes the first verse of, this, of our list of curses from this week's portion. It says, So this list of curses, the second list of curses, was actually said by Moses directly to the people. There are 676 letters in these 98 curses. Exactly 676 letters. What does that have to do with anything? Now, um... In the Hebrew language, every letter has a numerical value. So the first letter, Aleph, is 1, Bet is 2, Gimel is 3, and so on. So if you take the word Ra'ot, first letter is Resh, it's 200. Second letter is Ain, which is 70. Third letter is Vav, which is 6. And the fourth and the last letter is Taf, which is 400. 400 plus 200 is 600, plus 70 is 670, plus 6 is 676. Now, what does this word ra'ot mean? It means bad things. Where, but where did he, why, why, what, what's the connection here? Like, who cares? So, if you take 
it actually, so in this list of curses, it mentions the name of God exactly 26 times. The numerical value of the name of God is also 26. 26 times 26, if you want, you can put it on a calculator, but it says it right here, is 676. I checked beforehand, it's true. <laughs> so we have 676 letters, and we also have 26 times the name of God, which is also 676. Why does this number 676 keep showing up? What does it mean? So this 670, so we have the 676 verses of curses and we have uh, 676 from the name of God. It's mentioned 26 times. So it says these two 676s uh, balance each other out. The name of God sweetens the judgment that comes from these curses. And how, how, do, we, how do we know that there is this connection? There's a, there's a verse in... Uh, in Psalms, which was written by King David, Rabot Raot Sadiq, great are the number of bad things that happen to a righteous person. That, that's a little weird. Perush, Haklarot Harabot Shama Moshe Sadiq Betochacha. Which bad things are we talking about? What are we talking about with bad things and righteous people? He says, many are the bad things, which Sadiq, which righteous person is talking about Moses. Many are the bad things that Moses. Are the many are the bad things which are the curses that Moses told the Israelites? I mean, ninety-eight curses—that's a lot. I run out. Of, I run out of ideas at like five. <laughs> five is like my limit, and then, and then I'm done. O mikulam yitzilenu Hashem. So there's raot, the bad things, which has the numerical value six seventy-six, and then we have the. Uh, 676 from God. And it says, so in Psalms, it's, in Psalms, what King David is hinting to is, from all of these curses that Moses mentioned to us, God will save us from all of them. How do we know? So it reiterates that these two 676s balance each other out. But we're still not really sure how these two connect to each other and how we know that, the, that they sweeten each other needs more. Balaturim katav kavav shemot betochacha keneg kavav shemot shebitfilat kavav shemot shebitfilat yudchet chutz mi bekat aminyan aminin So the Balaturim who wrote, who codified, who was one of the people who came and codified Jewish law wrote that there are that the 26 times that it mentions God's name in the list of curses, there's also there's another place where God's name is mentioned exactly 26 times, and that is in the silent prayer that you do every morning for the men who pray, or if, you, if you've if you ever been here on Shabbat, during that silent prayer, the Amidah, or the Shmona Esre, that it's meant that the name of God is mentioned exactly 26 times. Lagen mikav vav shemot shebetochacha. So, as, even like as soon as we were put in the exile, we were given this mechanism to protect ourselves from these curses. We we we, we pray three. We have these three different times in the day where we're supposed to pray, and each time we have these twenty. We have this prayer with God's name in it twenty six times, and it's exactly, and it exactly equal to twenty six times in the curses. So it's it's kind of like our protection mechanism. It's really cool. We were like even as soon as we were put in the exile, we were already given a defense mechanism. It says, how do we know that this, that these two things are connected to each other? Because, you know, coincidences happen. Numbers don't always, just because two numbers are equal doesn't mean that they're connected. So how do we really know? It brings a verse from Parshat HaZinu, which will be coming up in a few weeks. And it says, and this verse translates to, for I will, for I will call out the name of God, and I will, and bring uh, greatness to our God. Matchila pasuk bekaf umesayim bevav. The first letter of that verse is kaf, and the last letter is vav. The numerical value of kaf is twenty, and the numerical value of vav is six. Twenty-six again. Kishem Hashem ekra, rei kavav pamim kavav. So when it says, I will call out Hashem's 
I will call out God's name. What does it mean I will call out God's name? It's talking about this 20, this 26 times of God's name is in the prayers. Well, when do we call out God's name? We call out God's name when we pray. So in this prayer, we have God's name 26 times. So he said, this, so, it's now, so now he's bringing everything together. He's saying we have the 676 letters in the, in the set of curses. We have 26 times God's name in the set of curses. We have 26 times God's name in this prayer. And now we're bringing it all together. Because this verse, you take the first and last letter, it's 26. So, wow. So what does it mean? It means, when we call out in God's name, when we pray, with these 26 times of God's name, so we have this defense mechanism. When we pray, this is, this is our defense mechanism. This is how we protect, this is how we know that these curses, that everything will be okay, even with this list of curses. And actually, after we finish with this with this prayer, with the one the one with twenty six times God's name, there's another thing we say. Have mercy on me and accept my uh, accept my apology. Or so. Every day there is this there is a custom. That uh, there's a there's a prayer that uh, we say in the mornings, or that we ask God for forgiveness for everything that we've done wrong every day. And if you take the the first letter of each of the four words that mean so rachem means have mercy, alai on me, the kabel and accept tachanuni my apology. So if you take the first letter of each of those words, reish ayin vav. Tough. Again, the same four letters, which add up to 676 in numerical value. V'chem betochachot shel mishneh Torah sh'amah Moshe mipi atzmo. Kav vav pa'amim sh'am ben Hashem, sh'am Hashem. Ze sh'amah ki sh'am Hashem ekra, kav vav pa'amim, kav vav. Azai havu gudele lokeinu. So we still have the second half of the verse from Hazinu to deal with. We have Kiyash Shem Hashem I will call it in God's name. But what about the second half of the verse? Bring greatness to our God. What, 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 are we, what greatness are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that what, what, well, how are we making God so great? We're saying God gave us these curses and it looked really bleak because nowhere explicitly does it say that everything is going to be okay. But God built in, within the Torah, within our prayers, within everything that He gave us to do, He, he gave us the defense mechanism before He gave us the curses. And that's, what, that's how we, that's how, by, that's how, by using these, this, 20, this prayer with, 20, with these 26 names, that's how we make God great. So it's... So... To close, we have the 26 names of God in the set of curses. We have the 26 names of God in the prayers. And we have this verse that says, I will call out in God's name and make him great. Okay, we, we can praise God from today until tomorrow, but why does that make a difference? When we are on a level of that spiritual ascension that we've been talking about, when we have achieved that level, we get to the point where we can start talking to God almost as equals, like Chonei Ma'agel did, and we can and we can start using that mechanism that God gave us, and that's what. So a lot of a lot of congregations for this week's portion have a custom to read the, the curses very quietly. Nobody should hear it. Um, according to Kabbalists, that is not the way to do it. If, the, if that is the way that uh, the, place, the, place, the place where you go to pray, if that's the way they do it, pick another place. I'm serious. Because these are not curses that we should be afraid of. This is, this is the greatest blessing that we could possibly have. Why would you say this quietly? This, this is everything. 
So, um, for the rest of the week, I would, you know, just the thing I took out of this, and this is, I, I learned, I learned a lot just by putting this together. And what I learned is that even when things look bad, have to remember that, I mean, with Rosh Hashanah coming up, and which is like judgment day for the world, things look bad. Okay. Do you believe, do you trust that God has a plan, that God loves you? And if you get to the point where you want to, once you get to the point where you only want to receive because you know God wants to give, if you know God wants to give, nothing bad can happen. God only wants you to have good. So the only reason that there would be curses or bad things is because you're not ready. So we have to become ready. And once we're ready, these curses dissolve. They're blessings. They become blessings. And that is what I would like to leave you with for this week. Thank you for coming and thank you for watching.